I didn't need that. <laughs> it's, uh, the song's got me all teary-eyed, and now he's making me feel it's going to be a bumpy ride. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, I want to share with you a little story, but I, want, I just want to give a little caveat. My, my memory doesn't seem to work the same way Pastor Vince's does. I, I think Pastor Vince has, in his mind, like a 76 HD screen that he can forward... You know, fast forward, rewinds, pause, and he can see anything in clear detail. My, my memory is more like this Bruder film. You know, it's, uh, it's choppy, it's shaky, it's grainy. You're not exactly sure what you're seeing. You think you know the main characters. That, that's how my memory works. But I wanted to share a story that I think would give you a glimpse into my heart as, as a father. I have uh, four daughters, as you know, and as you know, if you have children, that um, children certainly are not perfect. And my daughters are no different. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give any names and cast any aspersions any of them. But I know one day I came home and and much like the vice principal in school, dads, you're, you're the disciplinarian. When you get home, mom's been dealing with them all day, refereeing, arguing, fighting. And I remember walking in the door, and, and my lovely wife said, "You can deal with them." <laughs> you know, I'm glad to be here too. Um, <laughs> so I had to bring the two offending parties together and find out. What was going on? Of course, there was conflicting reports of who did what and when, where, and how. Um, so I said, all right, hold on. You leave. You stay. You tell me your side because, of course, they're, I did not. She did that, and that's not. All right. You give me your, it's like, you know, at the police. You know, you, you separate the witnesses. All right. Um, so I got the story from my one daughter, and, and she admitted some culpability, but um, I would say she was the least of the offending parties. And I brought the other daughter in to hear her side, and Hers was a completely different tale. Um, And I had a a sense in my spirit that I I wasn't being told the truth. Now, please don't get me wrong. I don't have many pearls of parenting wisdom to give you. And this is one of those moments where I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart because generally my reaction is, all right, I can't figure it out. You know, you're all grounded, right? Go to your rooms. Leave me alone. Come out tomorrow. Um, But in this particular instance... I felt the Lord say to my heart, let me deal with her. So I said, all right. I said, sweetheart, you're going to go up in your room, and life is going to stop. You know, there's no phone, there's no TV, there's no, there's no dinner until you let, you let God deal with your heart. I think he has something that he wants to speak to you about. So she went up, so of course, marched the stamp, stomped up the steps, slammed the door. I thought, well, she could be there a while. <laughs> Knowing this daughter, she, it's possible she could still be there. <laughs> but uh, some time passed. It was probably a couple of hours. And I heard her door open. And I heard steps slowly coming down the staircase. And I went to meet her on the staircase. And I could see in her demeanor, in her spirit, in her eyes, that the Holy Spirit had done some work in her life before she even made it to the bottom of the stairs. She was weeping, sobbing. Daddy, I lied. I lied. And immediately, my heart, as a father, I wanted to scoop her into my arms. I wanted to restore that relationship. I wanted to forgive her and move on from there. And I thought, as I was preparing the sermon for today, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 15 at the, uh, the parable that's often called the parable of the prodigal son, but I don't think that's the right name for it. There are two sons in this story, and there's, there's a father whose heart is broken. And I thought, me as a human father, if I desire to give good things to my children, restore relationship to them, how much more does our Father in heaven long desire and cherish that relationship with us and how it breaks his heart when we are out of that relationship with him. If I and my sinful humanity can feel that, I know we do have a good, good father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would get a glimpse of who your father is because your father is our father. And I pray, Lord, that I would not get in the way of what you have to do here this morning. In your name I do pray. Amen. 
And Luke 15, before we get into the parable, you have to know why Jesus told this parable. So if you look at verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So you guys know the Pharisees. If you've been to Sunday school, you know they're the bad guys, right? They didn't start out as bad guys. They started out, they, they were devoted to God's word and his law, but it turned into a legalism and a hardness of heart. And Pharisee means separated one. They like to separate themselves, first from the Gentiles, of course, from sinful Jews, but they also, they wouldn't even associate with, with less religious Jews than themselves. They were so devout. And they were obsessed with purity, doctrinal purity, ceremonial purity, moral purity, racial purity, social purity. And to them, eating with someone was tacit acceptance of their lifestyle. So here's Jesus, and he comes along, and he starts to spend his time with tax collectors and prostitutes and all kinds of sinners, and they're aghast. This man calls himself a teacher, and here he's accepting their lifestyle by by breaking bread with them. Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous, but for the lost. I came for sinners. There's a verse in Luke 10, verse 22, that I think really gets to what he's trying to say. In Luke 10, 22, Jesus says, No one knows the Son, I'm sorry, no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Jesus came to reveal His Father to a lost and broken world. And the Pharisees weren't prepared for it. And I don't know that we're prepared for it either. I don't know what picture you have of your human father. Some of you have a great picture. Dad of loving and warm and and, and funny and, and tough when he needed to be. But others, I know, we live in a broken world. And I know the image you have in your father may be one of abusiveness, of harshness, of cruelty. Maybe you don't know the love of a father at all. I don't want that image you have of your human earthly father to skew or distort the image of our true father, of our heavenly father. And Jesus doesn't want you to have that distorted image either. And that's why I believe he gave us this parable in particular. This parable is really three parables. It starts out in the beginning, he talks about a lost sheep. And he talks about a lost coin. And in the third part of the parable, he talks about a lost son. But each of them. When, when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he throws a party and he rejoices. When the woman finds her lost coin, she goes and tells all of her friends and, and she rejoices. And Jesus says, does not our Father in heaven rejoice over one sinner who comes to repentance? That is the heart of his Father. That is the heart of our Father. Do not let the image of your human Father destroy the relationship that you could have with your heavenly father because you don't know how to accept the love of a father. Let's read further on and pick it up in verse 11. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he said, I'm sorry, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And if, if you've been around church a while, you, I'm sure you've heard this parable before. And I've heard it a million times. But much, or like most of God's word, every time I go in, I find something different. God reveals himself to a new way in me, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would do the same and illuminate your mind this morning also. Don't miss it from your familiarity. Somebody, one, uh, one commentator, you know, he summarized the parable like this. He called it, sick of home, sick, homesick, 
home. I think that's a pretty good synopsis of what's going on here. The younger son longed for a better life. I don't know if he was tired of the rules of his father. It's not uncommon for young men to to want to spread their wings and fly, but there was a rebelliousness to this son where he said, I don't want your rules. I don't want your stuff. Well, I I do want your stuff, but I don't want to live here with your stuff. I want your stuff and I want to go. For him to ask for his inheritance before his father was dead was a huge insult, and it would have been shocking to his audience, to these Pharisees who, who, who elevated the father, the patriarch of the family. For him, basically, it was like him sending his father a card. You know, dear dad, violets are blue, roses are red, give me my stuff, I wish you were dead. You know, when you care enough to send the very best, right? <laughs> but that's essentially what he said to his dad. Dad, I don't want to wait till you're dead. I want my stuff now. And the more shocking thing is the father agreed. He was under no legal obligation. He was under no moral obligation. As a matter of fact, the law allowed for him to beat his son and to possibly even have him stoned for his rebelliousness. According to the book of Deuteronomy, This would be a huge insult, but the father agreeing to it would shock the hearers. And that was Jesus' intention, obviously, was always to shock people out of their comfort, out of what, you know, derail the train. I've got something new to teach you, to show you. And it says the father, he divided his property. And that word, divided his his property, it was, the word is bios, where we get biology from. His very livelihood. Do you realize he, he worked the land? For him, the younger son was entitled to one-third, where the older son would get a double portion, two-thirds of the estate. So for him, while he was still working at receiving income and preparing for a time where he would retire, for the son to say, yeah, I'm taking a third and it's mine now, the father was giving up his very livelihood to his son. And that was the attitude of the younger son. Give me. It's mine. I want it now. Now, the Midrash, the, the part of the Jewish law, did allow for the, for the property to be divided before the father's death but not to be sold and disposed of like that. This is extraordinary. So it says the son, in verse 13, he gathered together, which is synago. He gathered together, he turned it into cash. You know, those people out there, we buy houses, you know, we buy any car, dot com. He he made a quick sale of his father's good, and he was flush with cash. And we look at the son, and we call him the prodigal son. And prodigal has come to mean that son or that daughter who has gone away from the family, who, who's kind of the black sheep or turned his back. And, and that's, that's always what I thought the definition was. But I, I looked up the definition of prodigal, and the definition I found was wasteful. Wastefully extravagant, as a matter of fact. Having or giving something on a lavish scale. Unsparing. Bounteous. Lavish. See, I'm going to hint that the prodigal in this story is is not necessarily this younger son. But we'll get back to that in a minute. But where they get that word from is he went out and it says he squandered his property in reckless living. Squandered is the image of throwing to the wind like a a farmer would cast his seeds. The son was willy-nilly living the high life. He went out and he left, you know, he left the country lifestyle behind. He headed for the big city. You know, he got, I'm sure he got a brand new car, some new duds, went to the first nightclub he found and he said, everybody, the tab's on me. Instant friends. I'm sure he had a girl on each arm. He was everything that this world had to offer for pleasure. He sought after. Because that word says on reckless living, it's both wasteful and immoral is the tone of the word. But of course we get to verse 14 and we don't know how long it took. Was it days, months, years? But he found himself in a place where he spent everything. And to double it up, at the same moment, a severe famine Hit the land. That always happens when we go rogue. When we leave the home of our Father and His protection, God promises you will reap what you sow. If you sow seeds of destruction, you will reap the whirlwind. God promises that. And that is Him loving us. Because God knows that if we have one more dollar to spend, if we have one more friend to call a favor in on, we're not going to return until we're bankrupt. And that is love. It's tough love, but it's love. Because the entire time his son is out living recklessly, wasting his father's inheritance, there's a father who's home with a broken heart, 
praying, longing for his son to come to an end of himself. A child that would run out of resources so that he might return home. I heard a story of a pastor who had a rebellious son. It got to the point where the son was selling drugs out of the home and and had a physical confrontation with his father, so he had to put him out. And the father said, as he's gathering his stuff and he's in a storm, he says, son, you owe me one thing. He said, what? He said, if you find anything better than Jesus out there, I want you to come back and tell me. He left. Eighteen months, no word from this boy. One day there's a doorbell ring. Father's not home. The mother answers the door. And she sees something that looks like the cat dragged in on her stoop. Dirty clothes, dirty face, bruises. He says, Mom, tell Dad. There's nothing better than Jesus out here. And if you are out there and you are a prodigal and you are walking away from Jesus and trying to find the pleasures in this world, my prayer for you is that you would find it sooner rather than later. This world has nothing but bankrupt and there's nothing better than Jesus out there. So where is the far country? I believe the far country is a place of disillusionment. I believe that's a good place. It's where you finally get to a place where you say, is this all there is to life? And there's a father home that says, no, it's not. Come home. In verse 15, it says, he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. It was a huge and grievous sin to to lose your property, especially to a Gentile. It could be the, the cause of excommunication. But even worse than that, it says, he sent him out to the fields to feed the pigs. You know, in, in, the, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God says that the pig is the most unclean of the animals. And no, no you know, self-respecting Jew would be caught anywhere near a pig, let alone out in the fields feeding them. But that wasn't the, lot, that wasn't the bottom rung on the ladder. He still had one to go. Not only was he feeding the pigs, as he's feeding them, he's going, Mmm, that is looking good. <laughs> That's a pretty good clue. You've hit bottom. When you start becoming jealous of what the pigs are eating, you're probably in a place that you can't go any lower. For a Jew, this was the low of the lows. It was despicable work. He was with the pig slop. Now this, of course, would have been a shock to both the Pharisee and the tax collector. No Jew would sink so low. They would have winced. And I suggest to you that all this world has to offer, apart from God, is pig slop. We were meant for so much more than the slop. But we try to satisfy ourselves with, with money, with drugs, alcohol, relationships, success, sex. It's pig slop apart from Jesus Christ. And Satan is a deceiver and a liar. And he will lead you to believe that when you're in your father's home, there's better things outside. The world, the flesh, and the devil work together to confuse us, to distort our minds to distort God's word, and we are convinced we can't be happy in Christ. We try to satisfy ourselves with things that will never fill us, but God knows the deep longings of our heart can never be filled outside of him. So in verse 17, it says he came to himself, which indicates prior to that he was beside himself. He was out of his mind. The Bible says Satan has blinded the minds of the unbeliever. And he certainly does that to the unbeliever, but he can even do it to the believer, where he can deceive us. And he came to himself. Now, he came to himself. Jesus tells us that no man can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are at work together to convince this prodigal, this lost and wasteful, extravagant son, to never be happy with the slop. And as a son, if you truly are a son, you can't be satisfied with slop. Only the pigs really love the slop. The son will always long for home because that's our new nature. When we've been made alive in Christ Jesus and we've come to know him in repentance, even if we leave him, we have that nature that stays in us and we will never be satisfied with slop. And one day, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart and you would say, God, there has to be more. I'm eating slop. See, this boy never stopped being a son. When he left in the far country, when he when he hired himself to Gentiles, when he was living with the pigs, he smelled like a pig, he looked like a pig, he ate like a pig, but he was not a pig. He was a son. And then he remembered his father's house. And that is the beginning of repentance. When you remember your father's house and remember 
how he loves you. He's good, good father. And his love is amazing. And then you have to turn around. You have to change direction. That's really what repentance means. Repentance means turn around. You turn away from sin and you turn towards God. You do a U-turn. You have to turn from something in order to turn towards something. And that's what God wants. He wants repentance. And now in verse 19, this boy thinks, all right, I remember my father's house, but I want to go back and ask to be a hired servant. He has no concept of God's grace. He can't even imagine it. The best he can hope for, and to be honest, I think he's wishfully thinking, right? To a lot of us, you're going to go back to your father after what you've done? And he think, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to go into a business agreement with him. Because first you had sons, then you had the house slaves, then there were the day workers, the hired laborers. And that's what he's asking. He wants to go back to just be, he's not even worthy to be called a house slave, he wants to just be a hired servant. But in that, I think he's holding on to a part where he can still hold on to a little bit of his independence. You know, he didn't go home when the money ran out. He only thought of going back when he was completely destitute and barren. And now he wants to go back, but he's still at a little piece of him that says, yeah, I want to go back, but God, here's my conditions. Here's my terms. He wants to make a business agreement with his father. Let's look at verses 20 through 24. It says, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So we get here, you know, meanwhile, back on the ranch. Dad, how long had he been sitting by the window, sitting on the porch, watching the horizon for that familiar gate, the familiar stroll of the one that he loved? Was he there for days, months, years? It doesn't say. But it says he was there waiting. That is the picture of the father that we have. And it says while he was still a long way off, We think we have to do so much work to come back to God. We have to clean ourselves up and dust ourselves off and get ourselves right. Jesus was a fisherman, right? You clean your fish after you catch them, not before. There's nothing you can do to clean yourself anyhow. All our righteousness is like filthy rags to him. The father goes and he runs to him. He runs to him. To the Middle Eastern patriarch, There was no greater indignity than to run. They wore long robes. They were regal. They were distinguished. To run meant they had to hike up their skirt, tie it off, and go run and to free their legs. To the minds of the people here in this story, this is unthinkable. To run to any son, let alone this pig farmer, this disobedient, rebellious child, I can't help but think of that song that was out in the 90s, Philip Craig and Dean. They wrote a song called When God Ran. It says, he ran to me, placed my head on his chest, said, my son's come home again. He lifted my chin. He looked with tears in his eyes. He said, my son, I still love you. It's hard for us to imagine that. A God that we have been so antagonistic towards. He would not just accept us. Allow us a place at the table that he would restore us. What does he ask for? The son starts to, well, father, before he even could get most of his words out, he's hugging him and he's kissing him. And that word isn't one kiss. He's repeatedly kissing him over and over again. If you've been to the Middle East, you know they're much more demonstrative with their physical affection. I'm from an Irish and German family. We don't, we don't do a whole lot of that. <laughs> But the son is is getting kissed over and over again. And the father asks for the best robe, which would have been his robe, the father's robe. And he puts it on him. I can't help but think of the book of Isaiah. You don't have to turn there, but let me read it for you. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and a bride adorns herself with jewels. That's who you are. 
I don't know what image you have of yourself in God's eyes. I don't know the shame and the pain or the guilt that you might feel, but in God's eyes, when you return, you are clothed in his righteousness. He puts the best robe on you. And he doesn't stop there. He puts a ring on his finger. That's a signet ring that denoted that he was a son and had authority. He put sandals on his feet. Servants didn't wear sandals. Only sons wore sandals. And he asked for the fatted calf, which indicated that he was inviting the whole village because the father's heart was not just to restore relationship to himself, but that he would restore his son, his relationship to the entire community. And perhaps he ran to him because in Deuteronomy 21, it says the rebellious son could be taken out and stoned. And these people in the village were often, you know, the workers of the rich man, of the estate owner. These guys might have saw him coming and said, oh, there he is. Let's get him. Don't let him get anywhere near his father. We'll take care of him. So I think part of it was rejoicing. Another part of the father was to protect his son. You realize the same God who girded himself with a towel and washed the disciples' feet is the same God who welcomes us home when he washes us. And he doesn't just forgive us. That would be enough, wouldn't it? But again and again in the scripture, it says he chooses to remember no more our sin. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin from us. And because God is incapable of forgetting, he chooses not to remember. He takes our sin. He doesn't just forgive them, but he forgets them. He puts them away from us, never to be mentioned again. That is the Father. And if it was anyone other than the Son of God portraying God in this way, undistinguished, humiliating, running to the sinner, I would say it would be blasphemous to picture God that way. And I'm sure the Pharisees thought that. They picture God as a father, but God in in a sense of ownership. Not as a loving, compassionate, grace-filled father. The Father's grace is extravagant. It's frivolous. It's bounteous. Dare I say his love is prodigal. There's only one prodigal in this story. We serve a prodigal father who longs to abundantly lavish his love upon us. And he longs for relationship. That's what he wants. He doesn't want sacrifice. He doesn't want our money. He doesn't want our stuff. He wants our hearts. And his heart breaks when we are not in fellowship with him. And if you're out there today and you have a prodigal child, I can't imagine the pain and the heartache that your heart must be going through. But you are very close to the heart of your father if you have a prodigal. I can't imagine your pain, but I know that he can. And he's with you. And I would challenge you, if, you, if you're beating yourself over it, up over it, wondering what you did wrong, don't. Just pray. Pray that your prodigal would come to an end of his resources or her resources and decide to return home. And maybe t- today you are a prodigal. Maybe you're in a far country. This is what's waiting for you. Come home. That's not the end of the story, though, is it? There's another son. It says, verse 25, And now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered him, Father, I'm sorry, he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Apparently only two people in this story who were unhappy about their brother returning home were the older brother and the fatted calf. See, this older son is just as lost, is just as far away from the heart of his father as the younger son was. And he never left home. Didn't step one foot off the property. And so he comes in from the field. He doesn't go to his father. Who does he go to? He goes to a servant. He says, what's going on here? He doesn't even ask his father what's going on. See, Jesus was portraying the Pharisees in this story as this older brother. And they saw themselves in that role. But they were blind and deaf 
to the heart of the father. The only thing they could hear was the righteous indignation of the older brother. And they, I'm sure they thought, eh, exactly. And I have to admit to you, the first several times I read this parable, I, I felt a kind of a kindred spirit with the older brother. Yeah, who's this bozo think he is? Part of that inheritance, he's wasting his mind. The son refused to go in, which was a great insult to his father publicly. To, the, the older son was actually supposed to be the host of a celebration so his father could enjoy his party and his guests. And this, this boy's outside pouting. And he makes the father come to him, which was a public humiliation for a father to have to go out and call his son in. And now they have this argument right in front of their guests. And there's no honor in his title. He just says, look, this son of yours doesn't even call him his brother. He wants him to do Deuteronomy 21. Dad, let's take him to the gate and let's stone him. That's what he deserves. See, the older brother thought of himself as in bondage to his father. They had more of a master-slave relationship. He was a good man in, in the very worst sense of the word. He was dutiful, respectful, obedient, steady, dependable, industrious, thrifty. He had a good reputation in the community. He had a high sense of moral rightness. But he was farther away, farther away from the father's heart than the younger brother was. He never left home. His heart is totally out of sync with his father's and he cared only for himself. He didn't share in his father's joy at all. He was too convinced of his own goodness. He didn't take the daily opportunity to fellowship with his father. And his father, notice, he comes after that son too. He comes out to meet him where he is. He beckons him inside. He says, son, he calls him technon, which is a tender word. He says, my child. All that I have is yours. It always has been. Ephesians tells us we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies is ours. But he won't force it on us. It's ours for the taking. All we have to do is lay hold of it. If you're working to earn God's favor, you know that you're saved by grace. I can't get saved in my own works. But then from then on you think, I've got to work to keep it. You're operating under the wrong principle. Grace stays the foundation of the relationship. Paul tells us in Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? No. God chooses to bless us with His grace even after we come into His household and call ourselves sons and daughters. See, we have the wrong value system. The Pharisees based their relationship with God on their performance, on what they did, on keeping the law and the rules. And Jesus said to them, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. We are constantly comparing ourselves to that guy. Right? No matter who you are in church or in the world, you can find someone worse than you. Right? Well, at least I'm not doing that. At least I'm not doing that. At least I'm not doing that. I wonder who's the guy pointing at you going, at least I ain't doing that. Do we forget that the standard is not that guy? The standard is Jesus Christ. And we fall short of His perfection every single day of our lives. I am just as much in need of God's redemption and salvation today as the day I received it. Because today, I sin against greater light, don't I? I know the Word. I know His heart. And yet I still choose to disobey. And people talk about cheap grace. Oh, you can't, you can't just let anybody get saved. That, you know, if they all do it, you know, they're just going to walk all over me. Walk all over God. It's not fair. Cheap grace. There's no such thing as cheap grace. Because grace cost our Father everything He had. He sent His Son to take my place, to take your place on the cross. There's nothing cheap about that. Don't cheapen it by having the older brother attitude. This father was inviting both of his sons into another world entirely. It was a world based on his relationship to us. Based on love. If you've ever been a younger brother, if you've ever been a prodigal, if you've ever been a sinner coming to receive the love of a father, aren't you glad you didn't meet the older brother first? How many have been kept outside of the church because they meet the older brother before they get a chance to come back in union with the father? Don't be the older brother. Point people to Jesus. Remember who you are. And lead people back to the Father. It does not mean we can't admonish and exhort. It does not mean that. But it should come from a place of coming alongside with your arm around saying, Brother, 
Let me help you back. Let me help you find the way. Not, you're never going to get there, you pig farmer. So who became the better worker? The son who was lost and is found and realizes the goodness of his father? Or the one who stayed and served his father out of duty or obligation? The older brother represents the religious leaders who refused to go and join Jesus in welcoming sinners and rejoicing at the restoration into the family. But unfortunately, I see the older brother in my own heart too. You know, you have somebody out there saying, you mean I can... See, sometimes the hardest people to reach with the heart of the Father are those stuck in a religious system. Those caught up in the doing, their performance, the works. They'll say to you, you mean I've been going to church my whole life? I put my money in the offering? You know, I'm on this committee, I'm on that committee. I do good things. You mean... I'm not going to heaven, but that guy, that junkie who just came in here and said a prayer and got saved, that guy's going to heaven and I'm not? Say, now you're getting it. You're on to something. Because God is not interested in your performance. He's interested in your heart. And if you've tried to reach him based on your performance, you're never going to get there. Who are you this morning? I see both sons in my heart. I have that side of my heart that's rebellious, that's prodigal, that's wasteful and extravagant with what's not even truly mine. But then there's another side of my heart that is self-righteous, that wants to look down my nose and compare myself to other people and try to outperform them into in the God's favor. I don't know if you noticed, but there is a third son in this story, the one telling it, the righteous son. The one where God spoke from heaven. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. See, this son came to a far country, not out of rebellion, but out of obedience. He came to receive the prodigal, not to condemn the prodigal. And he willingly shares his inheritance with us. He died for his brothers. He didn't stand outside, his arms against his chest, huffing and puffing. He laid down his life. And John 1.12 tells us, To as many who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you're looking in the story, where is Jesus in the story? I believe he's there. He's the road that the son traveled back on to find his father. He's the path that the father invited the older brother onto to come back into fellowship with him in the home. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He bridges the gap. He crosses the gulf that our sin separates us from God, and He provides the way to the Father. He provides the way home. Will you meet Him there? Let's pray.